Around the year 1894, the famous inventor Nikola Tesla was testing one of his recent inventions, somewhere in a basement in the middle of Manhattan. Everything was going according to plan, until Tesla noticed something weird. Things around his workshop were vibrating. What started as a vibration in a glass of water, quickly escalated into furniture dancing around and culminated on the entire building shaking like spaghetti. Things started to get serious. In a desperate act, Tesla solved the problem by breaking the main valve with a sledgehammer. The tragedy was averted, but Tesla would very soon hear the sirens from police cars and ambulances, because apparently, it wasn't just Tesla's building that was shaking. In reality, the entire neighborhood felt the result of his experiment. This was the story that a 79 years old Nikola Tesla told at the press meeting during his birthday party. And even though it's almost impossible to confirm if the story is true or not, the device is real. The apparatus that Tesla was testing in that day, and is now known as the earthquake machine, was actually not created for that purpose, even if he said several times that it was able to destroy the Empire State Building. In reality, the device is a patented invention designed to produce electrical power, a mechanical oscillator that uses steam or other pressured fluids to vibrate at high frequency. By coupling the oscillator to magnets and placing it inside a conductive coil, it's possible to generate a high-frequency alternating current. A kind of current that, as you might know, Tesla was trying to introduce at the time. The device works in a fairly simple way, but its construction is very ingenious. In a basic setup, the device is constituted by three main parts. The main piston, the spring piston and the generator that converts the oscillating motion into electricity. The steam enters the device through two central inlets placed on the main cylinder. Once the steam reaches the piston, it will go through interior paths that guide it to the extremity of the cylinder. This increases the pressure in that chamber, what pushes the piston in the other direction. By moving the piston, it acts as a valve and the path for the steam changes. The pressure increases on the opposite chamber, which in turn pushes the piston again. This continues in a cycle that creates the reciprocating motion of the oscillator. Right above the main piston is the spring piston. And to understand its purpose, let's first look at a simplified example. Imagine a piston cylinder mechanism in which we have a spring attached on each side of the piston. If we push the piston, it will oscillate like a pendulum. And in an ideal setting, the piston would continue to oscillate with a constant amplitude and period. But in the real world, we have friction. Because of friction, the piston will slowly decelerate and eventually stop. But now imagine this. Each time the piston reaches the extremities of the cylinder, a short burst of pressured gas is released. This counteracts the effects of friction and keeps the piston going with the least amount of steam possible. This is the basic idea behind the spring piston present in the mechanical oscillator. The piston compresses the air present on both chambers as it moves. Because air is a compressible fluid, it acts like a natural spring that reinforces the reciprocating motion. After learning all of this, I was curious to see the mechanical oscillator working. I searched online for a working model, but apart from the ones that Nikola Tesla built, I couldn't really find one. So I decided to try and 3D print a prototype. I started by designing a simple version of the oscillator, with one inlet, two exhausts and no springs. I sent the model to the 3D printers and got a bloody red cylinder and a cheesy yellow piston. After removing the parts from the printer through the medium of crappy stop motion, I started to sand both parts until they fitted perfectly together. Once I was done, I decided that for once I should recycle the wasted plastic. After assembling all the components, this was the final result. But as you know from the thumbnail, this wasn't the final result. It doesn't work. And one of the reasons why it doesn't work is the fact that 3D printers don't actually print circles. They print ellipses. There's a small difference in dimensions due to the X and Y Cartesian axis. Which would be fine in normal circumstances, but not when I'm trying to make it hair tight. So I had to find another solution. To solve the problem I had three different ideas. The first one was to use a drill to sand the piston. I thought that if I sanded the piston uniformly, I would get a more cylindrical shape. But that didn't work very well. The difference in dimensions was still there. The second idea was to use a rubber seal to compensate the lack of precision on the print. It does the job, but the rubber causes too much friction. My last idea was to lose the cylindrical piston altogether and print a squared piston. 
there was still a small difference in dimensions, but as long as I printed the piston and cylinder in the same printer, the deviation would be compatible. I actually stole this idea from a Tom Stanton video. He used a square piston in one of his air engines, and it worked perfectly. I would tell you to go and check out his channel, but you probably know him already. Also, Tom, if you're watching this video... After sending all the parts and assembling everything, I tested the oscillator, and it works like a charm. If the charm is a piece of dry poo-poo, because it doesn't work. I tried some variations of the original design, but they all failed for the same reason. The piston gets stuck in the middle. That happens for a simple reason. The piston is not fat enough. In the original design, Nikola Tesla used steel to build the main axis and piston, and that makes it very heavy. It's harder to move, but it's also harder to stop, and that is what makes it work. The inertia of the piston is what keeps the axis moving through the central dead stop. This allows the piston to get to the other side, even when it's not actively being pushed by steam. I can't really build a metal prototype because I don't have the equipment necessary to machine it, so I had to be creative. A piston that acts as its own valve is a very ingenious idea, but in this context it wouldn't work. So I simplified the main piston and designed an external valve that is still triggered by the main axis. This valve uses the movement of the axis to shift the air supply from one inlet to the other. Because I'm a nice guy, I used acrylic sheets on the valve so you can see how it works in real-time sloppy slow motion. The air enters through the central hole and is redirected to one of the inlets, according to the current position of the piston. To make the valve, I 3D printed the main frame and the main lever, and then I assembled the 3D printed components to the acrylic parts using 4 M4 screws, a 6mm ball bearing and an M6 screw as main axis. To connect the tubes to the valve, I 3D printed an additional part that I glued using superglue. Once the valve was ready, I 3D printed the square cylinder and piston, which I promptly sanded until there was no resistance. Then I glued the inlet pieces that I 3D printed in black PLA on the cylinder, cut the main axis out of a 10mm steel tube, which I promptly inserted on the piston using super glue. To fix the acrylic walls on the cylinder, I used M5 screws. As linear guides for the axis, I used Teflon bushings to decrease the friction and make the cylinder more airtight. I 3D printed two limiters for the valve and support for the cylinder. In the end, I assembled everything on an MDF board I had laying around. On my first test with the oscillator, I noticed that the lever from the valve was stalling, but fixing that was easy. I added some weight to it by inserting a screw and two ball bearings, and voila, it was working. The next step was to build a small coil generator. The principle behind how this generator works is the principle of magnetic, magnetic induction. induction. Which in simple terms means if you oscillate a magnetic field near a conductor, you will induce a current in said conductor. To build the generator, I printed the part to hold the 27 10mm magnets I had laying around. I also printed the cylindrical support to cut the 0.6mm copper wire I bought, and the support for that support. And since we're talking about support, don't forget to support the channel by leaving a like and clicking that beautifully red subscribe button. First, I inserted the magnets on the magnet casing and inserted that on the axis of the oscillator. Then I assembled the cylindrical support and coiled the wire using the coiling machine. Coiling coiling machine. machine. Once that was done, I removed the insulation from both tips of the wire and tested the continuity. It works. I assembled the coil on the oscillator and ran a voltage test. Yup, you're seeing the numbers correctly. This beautiful generator is producing a voltage of 0 0.015 volts. With this voltage I can't even power a small LED. Pathetic. I can't understand what I did wrong. I need to do some research. In 1831, a very scientific man with very little formal education by the name of Michael Faraday established a very important law in the realm of electromagnetism. The, the law of magnetic, magnetic induction, induction that dictates that a very magnetic field crossing a conductor, such as a wire, induces an electric current in said conductor. The equation that translates this law into mathematical terms is named the Maxwell-Faraday equation, and looking at it, we can see that the voltage produced on the generator depends on the number of loops of wire, the useful area of wire crossed by the magnetic field, the change in magnetic flux, and the period of time that the magnetic field takes to change. 
To increase the number of loops in the coil, I bought a thinner wire with only 0.1mm in diameter. I went from 480 turns on the coil to almost 8000. Because the voltage produced depends heavily on the change of the magnetic flux crossing the wire, I tried to make sure that in one of the extremes of the oscillation, the magnets get as far from the coil as possible. The idea is to make the magnetic flux vary between almost zero and the maximum possible. And to increase the maximum possible, I bought four stronger magnets that have a surface magnetic flux of 0.25 teslas. That's right, the standard unit for the magnetic flux density is named after our boy, Al Holson. According to my calculations, with the modifications I made, I should get at least 4 volts out of the oscillator, what should be enough to power a small LED. Let's test it! My compressor puts out 8 bars of air pressure. I connected it to the oscillator and I got about 7 volts and the yellow blinking LED. I attached another LED and it still worked, so I attached another one and it kind of worked. Even though I got a way bigger voltage, because the wire is so thin, it has a bigger resistance to current which ends up limiting the power of the oscillator. To make a nicer setup, I soldered the blue LED to a GST connector and glued the entire thing on the oscillator. This is the final result. So, I went to all this trouble to build and improve my own mechanical oscillator to basically light up an LED? No, I did it to make a point. Tesla's mechanical oscillator is a viable way of generating alternating current. And even though I didn't use this one to power anything significant, it doesn't mean it wouldn't work with proper metal machine parts. The thing is you don't really see mechanical oscillators generating power anywhere. And that's because they're noisy, they eat up, and Nikola Tesla found a better solution. Just two years after he filled the patent for the mechanical oscillator, Nikola Tesla came up with a better way of generating alternating current the Tesla's alternating motor, one of his biggest contributions to society and a more efficient way of producing alternating current, not with linear motion, but with rotational motion. Even though the motor can generate alternating current, we still need a device to turn the motor. But don't worry, because Nikola Tesla also took care of that. Years after inventing the induction motor, Tesla invented a bladeless turbine that uses steam to reach very high speed. This device is known as the Tesla Turbine, and I actually have several videos about it. If you're interested, you can click on them on the end of the video. So, this is all the time I have for today. I need to get back to work. Uh, Tesla has over 300 patents, and I've barely scratched the surface. Uh, thank you for watching the video, and until the next time, bye bye! Ci sei tu a tutti, non